Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Stephen Davis, a professor of religious studies specializing in the history of ancient and medieval Christianity with a particular focus on the Eastern Mediterranean and the Near East. Since 2006, he has served as executive director of the Yale Monastic Archaeology Project, conducting field work and training graduate students at two sites in Egypt, the White Monastery near Sohag and the Monastery of John the Little in Wadi Natrun. Today we talk with Professor Davis about life and death in late ancient and early medieval Egyptian monasteries. Welcome, Professor Davis. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's begin with an overview. Um, you've written, recently written an article about the work that you did at both sites. So why don't we begin with you giving us an overview of the projects? Sure. Uh, my, my, pro my projects focus on monastic sites in Egypt, ancient mm -hmm. monasteries. Uh, and we began this work in 2006 in the north of Egypt. Mm -hmm. In Egypt, the, the, the Nile fl flows north. And so the north is lower Egypt, lower down in the river. Uh -huh. um, this site is in Wadi Natrun. Uh, and we, in 2006, we began surveying this site. And it's a, this amazing site. It's about a, a, a kilometer and a quarter by a kilometer across. Mm -hmm. And there are over 80 unexcavated structures um, that are visible by means of seeing uh, uh, mounds, sort of uh, uh, mounds on top of the uh, of the sand okay. that sort of mark the location of these structures. Okay. And so we began the first season doing some surveys and, and also excavating uh, an ancient trash dump at this mm -hmm. site. And then the following season we began excavating a, a residence, a monastic residence that was right next to that trash dump. Okay. Two years later I took on a second site in Egypt, in southern Egypt, that's Upper Egypt, at Sohag, the White Monastery. Uh, and at that site, we have a variety of different sort of remains. There's a, an ancient church, monumental church, huge church that survives from the 5th century there, okay. as well as a range of other, uh, art, a well, a gigantic well. And uh, one of the places that we've been working is a, is a smaller church with a tomb under it. Wow, okay. Yeah. So I'm curious. Um, I don't normally associate monasteries with Egypt, sure. of course. So I guess I'm curious how why you focus on monasteries mm -hmm. and how did you find these sites? Yeah, so uh, much of our sort of cultural knowledge about monasteries comes through Europe. Mm -hmm. right? the we think of like monasteries like in the name of the movie, The Name of the Rose. Right. Uh, but actually the, the earliest mon uh, monks came out of uh, Egypt and Syria. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Egypt in antiquity developed a reputation for being the sort of uh, birthplace of uh, early Christian monasticism. Wow. And there were a variety of expressions of it. There were uh, monks who went into the desert to live by themselves. Uh, there were uh, monks who wanted to live by themselves but sort of loosely congregated mm -hmm. in, in sort of clusters. Uh, and then there were some more uh, organized communities that followed uh, a common rule, uh, more similar to what we have in mind when we think of monasticism in mm -hmm. medieval Europe. Um, how I found these these places? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, particularly the one that's that's covered in sand. I mean, that seems. Yeah. So uh, the history of monasticism in Egypt is interesting. It has its roots in like the fourth century, mm -hmm. and the sites that uh, we work on uh, started around then and uh, continued to be active uh, up through the late medieval period, and in some cases to the modern period. But there was a kind of decline in monasticism during the late medieval period, mm -hmm. but. About 50 years ago, in the 1960s, the Coptic Orthodox Church has really promoted monasticism again, and there's been this boom. Mm -hmm. uh, monasteries that were either defunct or down to just a few monks mm -hmm. now have hundreds. And so both of the sites that we're working at, the remains are either within the bounds of active monasteries mm -hmm. or right next door to them. Uh, and so one of my jobs as director of the project is not only working with the material culture itself, uh, studying that for what, what we can know about ancient monasticism, but I have a lot of interaction with contemporary monks, mm -hmm. as well as uh, the Egyptian inspectors who accompany us in our work. So it's an interesting sort of contemporary cultural uh, enterprise mm -hmm. in making sure that the relationships are sound, the communication is clear. Mm -hmm. um, 
And it's one of the reasons I enjoy the work, actually. Mm -hmm. How long will it take you to uncover, you know, whatever it is you're uncovering? I mean, I would imagine mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a large building that's covered right. in sand. So, so, so. The, the residence that we excavated starting in 2007, mm -hmm. and we actually just completed the excavation this, this past year, is about 25 meters by 25 meters. Uh, it's made of mud brick. Uh, it has about 20 rooms in it, including a large courtyard in the middle. Mm -hmm. And so it took us that long. Six years. Yeah. Uh, we have, a, I mean, our method of doing archaeology is very painstaking. Yes. We're sort of taking uh, layers uh, and sort of documenting not only what's in the ground, but how it came to be in the, in the form it is now. So we're able to sort of figure out how it collapsed after it fell out of use. And one of the interesting mm -hmm. discoveries that we've made in this residence is one of the rooms had extensive wall painting program. Mm -hmm as well as a, a number of inscriptions, a lot of which uh, f sort of on painted on plaster. A lot of this plaster had fallen off the walls prior to our coming, mm -hmm. sometime after the building was no longer in use. And so we found these fragments of painted plaster in the sand fill that was in the room. Mm -hmm. And our painted pl plaster specialist, Jillian Pike, pieced these, these fragments together like a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm and ended up coming up with these amazing uh, wall paintings wow. of uh, monastic saints, of martyrs. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it, we, have, we have an idea of when, when the monks who lived in this residence, and we know the dating of this residence from the inscriptions. We have two dated inscriptions from the 10th century. Um, so we know a little bit about when they walked into this room, what they would have seen. Mm -hmm. uh, this sort of in interaction between monks coming into the room to pray, for example, and what they would have seen on the walls, where different figures, mm -hmm. sort of models for their own piety would have been located, what they would have been able to read on the walls, mm -hmm. dedicatory inscriptions, prayers, etc. Mm -hmm. So you must have to, have to have a lot of patience. And then how exciting to have something to be completely co covered, and then you uncover it, and then, you know, six years later you're able to see you know, what this structure was all about. I mean, it must be fascinating. It's a fascinating discovery, but there's also, it's interesting, there's also frustration. So you, you just narrated this <laughs> process of sort of uncovering. Actually, after every season, we cover it up again. Oh, we God. backfill. This is a building that is made of mud brick. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically the best way that we can preserve it is to take the sand that we have excavated sifted, there's now mm -hmm. clean sand, and backfill it into the space. If we would leave this building exposed uh -huh. uh, because of the, the elements, the sun, the wind, ca very occasionally the rain, mm -hmm. it would soon, you would soon see the results of deterioration. And there are examples in the area of uh, structures that have been excavated previously by other teams where they have left them open, open and, you know, and then there's also sometimes human interventions, vandalism right. and, and things like that. Right. Uh, so in that sense, we don't always get the gratification of the, at that particular site at least, mm -hmm. of, of seeing it sort of um, displayed. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the challenges in archaeology because our responsibility is not only the investigation, the excavation itself, mm -hmm. but it's also uh, figuring out how to be responsible with this cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means very specific uh, conservation methods so that we can display it and other times we're that's beyond our ability at this point right. or beyond the the, the, the level of, of, of expense that we can mm -hmm. can do and so we take the best approach that we right. can to make sure that for future investigators if they want to come back in they can find this building in good shape and do their own Very studies interesting. In it. so let's talk a bit about the findings and mm -hmm. um, the implications of those findings at both of the sites Sure. So I've said a little bit about uh, this residence. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've talked murals. about the wall paintings, but there's other things that are interesting about this mm -hmm. residence. Um, there's a number of kitchen installations in this residence, and from those kitchen installations, we have gotten uh, basically leavings from the ovens that we have uh, done archaeobotanical analysis on, mm -hmm. and we can get an idea of the kind of diet that the monks had. Of actual pieces of food? Yeah, sort of like uh, uh, remains of grapes. Um, uh, uh, grain. Mm -hmm. um, wow, that's yeah, interesting. Bean, beans. I mean, uh -huh. we have an idea of some of mm -hmm. some of what they 
ingested. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking it's all mixed in with sand and you have to like extract the beans and the grains from the sand. That must be... Yeah, there's particular met met yeah. methods of uh, flotation and, and to, in order to separate the sand uh -huh. from these other elements. Okay. So that's one example. And mm -hmm. another example from that particular building is we see the ways that the, the monks renovated their their spaces. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've just, at Yale, we've gone through this whole process of renovating buildings at Yale. The mm -hmm. colleges have gone through yes. you know, renovations. Well, the monks were doing this with their own buildings. They were, sometimes walls would become, uh, would sort of semi-collapse or become weak and they mm -hmm. would reinforce it. So we have really thick walls. They would close up windows. They would open up rooms. So it's a, you see the building as a kind of dynamic living mm -hmm. object and the way that the monks sort of uh, interacted with their space. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the site in the north. Okay. In the south, we've been doing a variety of things. Um, and I mentioned a small church with a tomb under it. And probably our most su surprising discovery came out of that. Uh, this was a, a church that had been excavated by the Egyptian inspectors starting in 2002. Mm -hmm. uh, when we came in, we uh, cooperated with them and then did some further excavations as well as conservation of, the, of, of what remained. There's some wall paintings, but within the tomb, uh, it's a very s small space, and um, one of the things that we did was conserve, the, uh, clean and conserve the, the paintings that we found in there. And a, f a couple of years ago, after a stage of that cleaning, we, we kind of came to a discovery. Um, on one wall of this space, this tomb space, is an image of a a human, human image. And it's an image of Shenouda, who was the famous leader of this monastery back in the fifth century. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a, an inscription a, a accompanying, a, actually in Greek, accompanying this, this figure. And he's, he's standing and you, he's holding a crown in mm -hmm. one of his hands and his other hand, arm is partially preserved. He would have been holding a crown there. And after this cleaning stage, we realized that he was flanked by two figures. Originally, we thought they might have been saints, but you could see edges of wings. So these okay. figures were angels. Okay. And this, uh, the placement of a, of a human figure between angels in this particular posture is very much related to funerary representation. Okay. Um, and so uh, that combined with the content of the inscription led us to conclude that it's very likely that this particular tomb was uh, prepared for this famous figure. Mm -hmm. And we sort of came up out of the tomb and looked at each other and realized, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> we couldn't believe that this, mm -hmm. that uh, that's what the conclusion we were drawing was. Right. Um, so uh, that was a very uh, surprising but wonderful discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, one, there's also a, a church there. My colleague Bentley Layton in the uh, re uh, Religious Studies Department has been doing architectural documentation on that church. Mm -hmm. And as part of that work, um, we were trying to clarify some architectural elements, and we wanted to excavate a niche in one of the rooms, sort of upstairs uh, in this church. And um, in doing that, we needed to p clean and excavate the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, and in doing that, we found, we ran across manuscript fragments. Okay. Um, one of the things that this monk Shenouda was known for was uh, producing the largest corpus of, of literature in Coptic that we have. Mm -hmm. And there's an international project right now editing his works. Okay. And at w we knew that a lot of these works were originally uh, kept somewhere in this church uh, and had been disseminated like in the 18th, 19th centuries all over the world. So, so you, in order to study him, you have to go to like Moscow and Paris mm -hmm. and you know, Cairo and you know, all these different places. But we w had never been absolutely sure where these texts have been kept, where the sort of archive had been. Sure. Well, these fragments have been allowed us to confirm that at least for a, a particular period of time, this room was used to store mm -hmm. those manuscripts. Some of them match up. Um, and so uh, they essentially, when, when, when people, had, when the monks had, had taken the, the manuscripts out of that room, some of the f brittle edges had broken off. Sure. And so that was, a, that was another really uh, neat uh, discovery. Right, right. So I understand that you are not done there, that you will um, continue work in both places. Yes. Do you have any um, thoughts as to what you may find or perhaps um, what you would hope to find? Sure. Um, 
in the south, the White Monastery, mm -hmm. one of our one of the things. Uh, this is not so much a finding, but one of our responsibilities is to make sure that the the church remains in good shape. There are parts of the church that are hazardous. Mm -hmm. So this this is a church that's still in use by the Coptic community, wow. and yet there are spaces where walls are kind of uh, threatening to fall down. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we have going on at least next is is some consolidation work on that. Mm -hmm. uh, at our other site, uh, we're in the process of preparing a book documenting the excavation of this this uh, resonance. But we have about 79 other buildings to choose yeah. <laughs> choose from. And so uh, what I would like to find I would like to work on is uh, getting some comparison, uh, looking at some other resonances, mm -hmm. seeing what other uh, art historical evidence is yielded from that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things about doing monastic archaeology is we simply there simply has not been a lot of it done, you know, handful of projects over the years. And why do you think that is? Well, there's, a, there's an interesting history in archaeology, especially in Egypt. Mm -hmm. So uh, traditional sort of classical archaeology in Egypt was always looking for the sort of pharaonic remains. Mm -hmm. let's, let's go to the pharaonic temples. And uh, a lot of the later historical layers, Coptic and Islamic layers, were sort of layered over those remains. And so the archaeologists would simply sort of dig through and really discard a oh, lot of this boy. valuable historical evidence to get to what they wanted to get to, right? right? And, um, and, so, and so I think it's important to pause and look at these later periods to see what sorts of developments were taking place in the way that people were living uh, and the way that people were, were dying, the way that people were uh, burying loved ones, right, sure. within monasteries. So that's one of, the, one of the things I think is really important about this work, and it gives us a real kind of textured sense of everyday life uh, from you know, the, the late an ancient period, 4th, 5th, 6th centuries, mm -hmm. up, up to the, the medieval period. Okay, well, thank you so much for being here with us thank today. You. It's been fascinating, and we'll look for uh, more work to come. Yeah, for sure. Okay. For more information about Professor Davis and his research, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.